Ciao, buongiorno, come sta? Tutto bene? Posso? Grazie. It's lunchtime here in Palermo. What could be more Italian than to have a bowl of pasta? Allora, come a pasta, che cosa è? And so the story goes, Marco Polo, that great Italian adventurer, brought pasta back from China. But here in Sicily, we have an account from a century before Marco Polo by the Arab geographer Al Idrisi of a town just down the coast from here, from the town of Trabia, where they were making what he called Italia, long dried pieces of semolina, effectively tagliatelle. So it seems that pasta was actually introduced to Sicily by the Arabs. And from there, it quickly became the nation's favorite dish. Sicily has always been on the border of two worlds, as much North African as it is European. From the ancient Greeks to modern migrants, the island's life and character have been shaped by an ever-shifting tide of humanity. Some have come to loot and conquer, others to build a new life, but all have left their mark on the Sicilian soul. Hmm. Is it too late to run away? I'm Michael Scott. As an ancient historian, I'm on a journey to discover how Sicilians, so rarely in control of their own destiny, have forged an identity and culture that is, well, so Sicilian. We live on a volcano, <laughs> but it's normal, <laughs> yes. How they've learned to face the future from a turbulent past. I want to know what Sicily's history and people can tell us about how to survive in our fast-changing world. We are giving an example to the rest of Europe. Welcome is the best guarantee for safety. Barely a hundred miles from Africa, Sicily has long been a Mediterranean stepping stone. Since the start of the 8th century, Muslim Arabs had ruled the North African coast, just a day's sailing away. Asara del Vallo today is a thriving cosmopolitan town. There's a large Tunisian community here who work on the fishing boats, for example. But it was also the place where the Arabs first came ashore in Sicily in the 9th century in 827 upon the invitation of a rebellious Byzantine governor who got himself involved with a nun. It's a long story, but so was their gradual occupation of the island, for it took the Arabs over 50 years to conquer this place. Palermo became Sicily's new capital. And as the island opened up, Immigrants flooded in, fleeing famine and unrest in North Africa. Under the Arabs, Christians and Jews had less civil rights than Muslims, but they weren't forced to convert. Within a generation, the island had become one of the most multi-ethnic states in the whole of Europe. These things I saw on the plane over here, a lovely Sicilian lady was sitting next to me and she had one in her bag on the plane. I've no idea what it is, but it looks great. With strong links to the rest of the Arab world, Sicily became one of the great trading centers of the Mediterranean. This is my kind of fish stall. You get to look the fish in the eye before you eat it. Fantastic. Welcome to the Ballero markets here in Palermo. I've been here thousand years, dating back to the time of the Arab conquest that brought with it so much of what we utterly take for granted here today. Pistachios, almond, saffron, couscous, watermelon, sugarcane, and also systems of irrigation and agriculture that absolutely revitalized the western half of Sicily. And here in Palermo, the Arab city that was created with beautiful gardens and mosques and palaces and bazaars like this one, Arabs welcomed Christians, Jews to trade here. It was absolutely the cosmopolitan melting pot of the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries. Most Sicilians are proud of their Arab heritage, but only a few material traces of those years have survived. Just to keep us going for a while. We've come to high ground on the outskirts of central Palermo in search of some remnants from the era of the Arab control and conquest of Sicily. 
and I'm told that right here, there's an entrance to an underground world. Ciao, buongiorno. Come va? Ciao. Tutto bene? Ciao. Piacere. Possibly a little tight for me, our long shoulder. But we're not going with electric battery lights here. We're going old school. We're going with gas powered lighting. This is amazing. Bravo. Okay. I'm like a large candle. <laughs> Eight meters down lies a hidden network of tunnels, the Canats, a gravity-fed irrigation system that carried water from the hills above into Palermo and to the fields beyond. Obviously, if the water's hidden down here, it can't be contaminated by human hand or nature's hand so easily, but also because down here, even with the hot weather, it doesn't evaporate. Genius. But also, what we're seeing here is a system that's designed not just for bringing water for people to drink, but water that can be used for irrigation, for crops. And it's that that really allowed Palermo to expand massively. So they distinguished between the water in these pipes, which was for drinking, and the water on the floor of the canat that was for irrigation. So this, this was the really good drinking water. Possiamo bere anche oggi? No? Okay. Palermo was one of the only cities on Sicily that had this system of canats constructed because it was a city of something like 200,000 people, possibly the 10th biggest city in Europe at the time. And it needed a lot of water to be able to keep the people happy each day. So here we've got an access point between different levels of the canet. Rosanna's saying, go down and have a look. Okay, so oh, here we go. Così. Oh. <laughs> this feels a much more constructed tunnel. We've got this man-made vaulted roof, very smart looking roof on both sides. Look at the quality, look at the clarity of this water. Absolutely unbelievable. Coming from that direction from the mountains, heading in towards the city. Absolutely superb craftsmanship. You don't have to, though, go to such extraordinary lengths to see the remnants of the Arab period in Sicilian history. Here, Palermo Cathedral, this column has an inscription from the Quran and it ends with saying, unquestionably, his is the creation and the command, blessed is Allah, Lord of the world. Now, this pillar comes from the Arabic mosque that was on this site and before which there had been a Byzantine church and now stands Palermo Cathedral. And this column has been part of this building for approaching almost a thousand years. And as such, it speaks to Sicily's pride in the confluence of cultures that has defined its history. That mix of cultures was about to get even more diverse. Gathering in southern Italy across the narrow straits of Messina was a group of adventurers only recently arrived from Normandy. In the early 11th century, a Norman band of brothers led by the de Hautefield family came down to southern Italy as mercenary soldiers, and by 1040, they were the most powerful force in the area. It wasn't long before they started looking with avid eyes towards Sicily. Two of the de Hautevilles, Robert and the youngest of the brothers, Roger, led the invasion force. In 1061, the same decade that the Normans would also invade England, Robert and Roger crossed the straits between Italy and Sicily to take the town of Messina. But unlike William the Conqueror's quick conquest of England, it would take Robert and Roger 30 years to get Sicily properly under control. 
One of the reasons it took so long was Robert had to keep going back to sort out southern Italy. And Roger took, unlike William the Conqueror in England, a much more softly, softly approach to conquest. He worked with the local Arabs. Indeed, many joined his own forces. And it was from places like this, the castle of Venus, that the Normans established their control of Sicily. Roger became the de facto ruler of this island, and his reputation went through the roof. He's described as being tall and eloquent and handsome and diplomatic and a great warrior and a scholar, and frankly, it makes you quite sick. Sponsored by the Pope, the Norman invasion of Sicily had been a Christian enterprise. Yet Normans, Greeks, Jews and Arabs were now granted equal rights, free to practice their own religions and cultures. When Roger died, power passed to his son. Named after his father, Roger II had grown up surrounded by different cultures and religions and was determined to build on his father's legacy. <laughs> Roger I had been a Norman count. Roger II had himself crowned as the first king of Sicily. Situated here at the heart of the Norman palace in Palermo is this room, the Palatine Chapel, commissioned by Roger II and inaugurated in 1143. And it really feels like the entire world has been sucked into this one room and as a result created a sensorial overload. On the one hand, Norman architecture, Italian marbles on the floor and the lower walls, but we're also surrounded by these shining Byzantine gold mosaics, and above our heads, a beautiful Islamic wood-carved ceiling. What makes this chapel so remarkable is that at the time it was being constructed, Europe was still dealing with the after effects of the great schism between the Western and Eastern Christian churches. And Europe was at war with the Islamic world and the Crusades. And yet here, in Sicily, in a place that had seen all of those influences come and go, this chapel brings all of them harmoniously together. Roger II was king of the third largest kingdom in Europe at the time. And when he sat here in his chapel, he must truly have felt that he sat at the confluence of civilization. Sicilians look back on the Norman period as a moment in time when Sicily got it absolutely right. Memories that they keep alive in a uniquely Sicilian way in the puppet theatre. I've come to the Borgo Vecchio district of Palermo to meet Enzo Mancuso, whose family have been making puppets and putting on puppet shows for three generations. Enzo? Ciao! Come va? Tutto bene. Puppet theatre became popular in the 18th century, but its origins are much older. The traditions and stories handed down from father to son. True puppeteers don't just operate the puppets, they make them as well. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> In a world before television, puppet shows were the soap operas of their day. 
a mishmash of history, tales of Sicilian love and honour, treachery and justice. So when you think of puppet shows, you think of Punch and Judy, but this is so much more. This is stories of legend, of myth and of history all wrapped up together in some of the most realistic and, and frankly, bloodthirsty puppeteering I've ever seen. When Norman rule ended in Sicily, power passed to a man called Frederick II. Now, this guy acquired royal titles like, well, most of us acquire hats. He was the king of Sicily, he was the king of the Germans, he was the king of the Romans, he was the Holy Roman Emperor, he was even the king of Jerusalem. But for me, the most interesting thing about this guy is that he employed a wandering Scottish intellectual as his advisor, and his name was, if you can believe it, Michael Scott. It was a very solid choice, I think you'll agree. Now, this guy was a well-known translator of Greek, Latin and Arabic texts, and he and Frederick became firm friends. Ciao, whatever. And if I was that Michael Scott, I would have advised Frederick this, that while everything seems rosy in Sicily right now, there may be trouble ahead. Because while Sicily had been a kind of single entity with its own royal household, now it was part of a much bigger geopolitical game. One that would, as so often in history, see Sicily on the losing side. Fai attenzione, eh? Ciao. I've come to take part in a native Sicilian sport. Stick fighting. Bastone. On the death of Frederick II, Sicily fell into chaos and confusion. It was a time when Sicilians needed to defend themselves and their possessions. A questo punto io voglio provare. No? Certo. <laughs> Lei può mi insegnare sì, un sì, po'. Sì, sì, Bravo. Sì. Okay. So we're going to have a try of this and Giovanni is very kindly going to teach me a few moves. Stop. Mano destra. Io ho bisogno di sì, a... For many years techniques of knife and stick fighting were taught only in secret. But now they're practiced for sport. Sicily's very own martial art. Wow. Che okay. quando si fa sì. a I used to fence for many years, and I can see lots of similarities, but also key differences. And partly, I think it's to do with where this sport originated, from shepherds with their staffs protecting their flocks, both from wild animals, as well as from people coming to steal from them. I like the fact we're starting with going for the face. It sounds pretty brutal. Why? OK. 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 OK, so now we're going not just for the face, but for the body. This is a full-on attack, which I have to defend from Giovanni. Valentemente, per cominciare. He's going to be gentle on me, to begin with, at least. OK. Via! Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei, via! Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei! Fantastico. From the Middle Ages on, Sicily would belong to foreign powers, no longer in charge of its own destiny. But Sicilians are nothing if not adaptable. In 1282, 500 years of Spanish rule began. And when Spain discovered the Americas, ideas and products from the New World began to arrive on the island. And in the town of Modica in southern Sicily, they were blended into a very Sicilian confection. So this is the chocolate, huh? This is the this is our chocolate. Modican chocolate has been made the same way for the last 500 years, worked cold, so it never becomes completely liquid. You can hear the granules in the chocolate. Yes, the texture is very grainy because the sugar never melts at the temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
how long has this recipe been made here in Modica? But we often say that uh, this was chocolate before chocolate because Modica was a Spanish county. So during the Spanish domination, Spanish people brought this kind of working. I mean, I love the idea that the cocoa is coming from the Americas to Sicily. You're mixing it with sugar here in Sicily, another import to Sicily to creating special Modicum chocolate. But then you're adding spices from all the different places and peoples that have come to Sicily and been part of Sicilian history. So this, this chocolate mix is a kind of metaphor for what Sicily is. It is our philosophy of production. In everything we do, we mix uh, all, all kinds of cultures that visited Sicily and then uh, meet together in Sicily and together could uh, go out of Sicily. So only this particular melting pot yeah. of influences and ideas give us something that there is nowhere else in the world? Sure, sure. Yeah. sure. Spanish rule brought New World influences to Sicily, but it also delivered one of the Old World's greatest horrors. This is a Moreton Bay fig tree, originally from Australia. The seeds take host in another tree, then grow these enormous roots down towards the ground and then strangle their host. And it's a very appropriate tree to be growing here in this square, which today looks very calm and peaceful and pleasant. But this was the headquarters of the Spanish Inquisition, just over there in the Palazzo Chiaramontesteri. Up until this point, Sicily had been a place of multi-faith toleration. But that was to be no more. The Spanish Inquisition was formed in 1478, and in 1492, the rulers of Spain issued a new law banning all Jews from Spanish territories, and that included Sicily. This was a real problem for Sicily. In some towns, 10% of the population were Jews. They were doctors, weavers, metal workers, and many people from Sicily demanded that they be allowed to stay, but the rule was enforced in 1492 and 1501. The work then for the Spanish Inquisition here in Sicily was to focus on those who had supposedly converted to Christianity and to root out those who were not proper Christians. In the honeycomb of former cells in the basement of the palazzo are layers of graffiti left by the prisoners as they awaited torture at the hands of the Inquisitors. For around 300 years, the Spanish Inquisition was active in Sicily, seeking out heretics, those who communed with the devil and those who read forbidden books. It was a terrifying time. Even information given under religious confession could be used by the Spanish Inquisition in their trials, as well as information gained under torture. If found guilty, people could be sentenced as galley rowers, effectively a death sentence. They could be incarcerated in prison, they could be sent into exile, or they could be executed and burned at the stake. Here behind me, the prisoners have drawn the symbol of the Spanish Inquisition, this crescent-shaped dragon with the sharp teeth and eyes, and it's either spewing out of its mouth or about to eat a key set of biblical figures that are all on their knees. There's Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. The Walls are covered in drawings and in text, and what strikes you very quickly is that they're not complaints about the terrible conditions. They're not cries out from individuals' personal lives. Instead, they are statements of faith. Now, on one hand, that's kind of ironic that people who are here incarcerated for not being proper Christians are, are scribbling on the walls professions of Christian faith. But on the other hand, it's, it, it tends to make me think that these people saw themselves as suffering the same kinds of injustice as Jesus Christ had done. They were, as Christians, following somehow in his footsteps.
This scene obviously is well known. This is Jesus being forced to carry his cross on the way to his crucifixion. But check out the Roman soldiers. These guys, by their dress, by their hats, are clearly not Romans. These are the Spanish. And so it's another image in which the line is blurred between the poor people who were incarcerated here by the Spanish Inquisition and the trials and tribulations they were going through and the trials and tribulations that Jesus Christ had suffered. When the Inquisition ended in 1783, the Inquisitors burned all records of their deeds. The prisoner's graffiti is all that Sicily has left to tell the tale. While some Sicilians were being condemned to death by the Spanish Inquisition, another Christian community was reveling in the preservation and display of their dead. These are the Capuchin catacombs in Palermo, but the bodies around me are no ordinary corpses. They are, in fact, mummified bodies. The practice began at the end of the 16th century when the Capuchin monks were expanding their cemetery and they found that the original monks buried here before, their bodies had been naturally mummified. They thought it was an act of God and as a result did not rebury these friars but actually put them on display as relics and continued the practice. And as a result, down here today, there are well over 1,000 mummified corpses staring at you. Palermo has the perfect climate for mummification. Low humidity combined with the cooler air and porous limestone of the crypt, helping to dry out rather than rot the bodies. We are standing in the engine room of the mummification process. They would bring the body in here, they would open it up, take out all the internal organs and stuff the body with straw. Then they would leave it for up to a year on these terracotta cylinders so that any remaining fluids could drain away. Then they would dress the body in a set of clothes that the person had chosen before their death, and then they would take it out to be hung up in one of the passageways outside. As a result of the smell, well, I'll leave it to your imagination. Soon enough, it was not just the Capuchin monks who wanted to be mummified, but people of each gender, every age and profession. As a result, there are corridors here of men, corridors of women, corridors of professionals, chapels of young virgins, chapels of children, and here, the corridor of families. And it was here, in this corridor, that the very last mummified body was placed in 1920. This is Rosalia. She was two years old when she died. And although the catacombs had technically been closed for a hundred years or more at this time, her father, a very important Sicilian, managed to persuade the authorities to allow her body to be mummified and placed down here. And due to the almost perfect state of her preservation, she's known today as the Sleeping Beauty of Palermo. Little Rosalia was almost certainly named after Palermo's much-loved patron saint, who it is said delivered the city from plague. In the 12th century, a Norman woman called Rosalia left the city and headed up into the mountains for a life of prayer and meditation. She died in the mountains in a cave. And then, in the 17th century, Plague hit Palermo. Just two years, 1624 to 1626, something like 25% of the population died. The city sought some kind of help. It was during that time that one man was given a vision to search for the bones of Rosalia. He found them, brought them back to Palermo. Buonasera. He brought them back to Palermo, where they were given proper honours and processed through the city. And as a result, it seems, the plague was lifted. And so, Rosalia was made the patron saint of Palermo. Rosalia. 
Every year, on the night of the 3rd of September, people start to process from the centre of the city to walk up the mountain. It's quite a long walk to the cave where she died, which is now a church. For some, they will make this climb not only in prayer, but perhaps even barefoot. It's been said that some do it on their knees. For others, it's not just a religious occasion, it's also a social and a cultural one, a moment for people from Paloma to take a step back from their normal lives and have a moment to think, to spend time with friends, with family, to have a tradition that brings them together every year. Climbing in the name of religion, as I was soon to find out, seems to be something of a Sicilian pastime. I'm reliably informed that we've come up something like 250 steps. And the reason we've made it all the way up here is to see this. One of the best examples of Sicilian Baroque architecture. Italians are no strangers to earthquakes, but on the 11th of January 1693, Sicily was struck by one of the worst earthquakes in the whole of Italian history. Tens of towns were devastated. Something like 60,000 people were killed. If one were to look for some kind of silver lining from this disaster, it would be the fact that the Sicilians responded with a desire to rebuild some of those towns in greater form than ever before. The result was, amongst other things, this. The Church of San Giorgio here in Modica. It's a prime example of Sicilian Baroque, the style that flourished in this period. It's flamboyant, it's exaggerated, it's over the top, it's full of gaiety and life. In some ways, in direct contrast and competition with the devastation and disaster that had preceded it in towns like this. Ciao, come va? Tutto bene? Posso lavare una granita? Sì. Faccio la migliore granita! Bravo, la migliore granita. The Arabs named the port town of Masala in western Sicily. It was the Masa, the port of Allah. But it's a name that also recalls a strong relationship between Sicily and Britain. Masala wine, that's how we know this place. Indeed, masala wine was invented by an Englishman, a Yorkshireman, John Woodhouse, in the 18th century, who came here to Masala and made this fabulous creation. And lots of famous people have contributed names to different masala wines over time. Lord Nelson, who also was in Sicily in the late 18th century while he was having his long-standing affair with Lady Hamilton, named a masala wine. And then, of course, another was named after Garibaldi, that hero of Italian universe. And in fact, I'm standing outside the Porta Garibaldi, the Garibaldi Gate of Masala, because it was in Masala that Garibaldi first landed in Sicily when he was to begin his quest. And on the day he landed, there were two British frigates also in the bay. And it's said that the presence of those British ships stopped the Spanish Bourbons from obliterating Garibaldi in his tracks before he'd even begun. Cheers. Garibaldi's conquest of Sicily brought him to Palermo. In May 1860, Sicily emerged from centuries of slumbering in the shadows to once again become the center of the world's attention. Giuseppe Garibaldi leading a force of a little over a thousand men, took the city of Palermo and freed Sicily from the Spanish Bourbons. And in so doing, began the process of the unification of Italy. News of Garibaldi's achievements spread across Russia, America, and of course, London, where they were even fundraising for him. Charles Dickens and Florence Nightingale contributed to the cause. And in the ultimate accolade, 
Garibaldi had a biscuit named after him, the Garibaldi Biscuit. In October 1860, Sicily was given a chance to vote on whether it wanted to become part of a unified Italy, and 99.5% of the voting population voted yes. And this building is the result, the Opera House of Palermo, built to put Palermo on the map. It's the largest opera house in Italy, the third largest in Europe, and every part of its construction was supposed to hit the high notes of Sicilian history, from the Greek columns on the exterior to the stage curtain, which had an image of the coronation of King Roger II from the 12th century. With this building, in this building, the people of Palermo could feel they were truly on the world stage. No longer would Sicily be ruled from afar. The greatest threat now would come from within. In the ancient Greek theatre at Taormina, the opera Cavalleria Rusticana. First performed in 1890, it was an instant hit. Telling a tale of jealousy, pride and vengeance in a small Sicilian town. When the young soldier Toridu accepts a duel with the cart driver Alfio by biting his ear, one of them must die. These were men of honor. In the opera's rehearsal room, I met director Bruno Torisi and actor Filadelfo Paone. Avete altro a dirmi? Io no. No. Allora, sono agli ordini vostri. Aurora? Aurora. Aurora. E questo è il contratto sì. indivisibile sì, 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 tra sì, noi due. Ha sì, confermato che sarà presente, non si tirerà indietro, avrà il coraggio di presentarsi e fino all'ultimo sangue. Eh, con il sangue, l'ultimo sangue si, si dice alla morte, sì, infatti. Sì. Among the opera's biggest fans were the Sicilian Mafia. Born in the aftermath of Garibaldi's liberation, they ran protection rackets in the lemon groves around Palermo. Now their violence could be explained away as nothing more than Sicily's primitive code of honor, a myth that they would carry with them into the modern world. By the early 1980s, the Sicilian Mafia had grown more bloodthirsty than ever before. In the space of two years, at least a thousand murders. Magistrates Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino led the fight back. Until in 1992, when a massive explosion ripped apart the motorway into Palermo, killing Falcone, his wife, and three police officers. Less than two months later, Borsellino and five policemen died in a car bomb. The public outcry led to the arrest of Salvatore Rina, the Mafia boss who'd ordered the assassinations. He was convicted of over 100 counts of murder. Rina's family left Palermo and returned to their hometown of Corleone. Before long, Rina's teenage son, Giovanni, was throwing his weight around. In 1995, Emiliano Somalini was 13 years old when he went to visit his cousin in his aunt's clothes shop in Corleone. They were among the town's young men and women who'd refused to bow down to mafia intimidation. I was very attacked by my cousin. We had the passion of motors, of cars, things for kids. My cousin was a major N. Quasi tutti i pomeriggi passavo il pomeriggio da mio cugino nel negozio. E come tutti i pomeriggi prendevamo il caffè e quel pomeriggio mia zia non c'era e quindi esco io per andare a prendere il caffè. Quando sono tornato ho trovato mio cugino Giuseppe ucciso con cinque colpi alle spalle dalla mafia. Emiliano's cousin had been murdered by Giovanni Rina 
and fellow mafiosi. La cosa più brutta è il fatto di rimproverarmi ancora ora quando sto parlando con lei di essere qui. Che non capisco il perché. Perché lui sì e io no. Less than a month later, his female cousin, Giuseppe's sister, was driving with her family when the mafia struck again. Mia cugina quando vede arrivare la macchina si butta col proprio corpo sul sedile posteriore della macchina per fare da scudo umano ai propri figli, uno di tre mesi e uno di un anno. I bambini si salveranno, ma i miei cugini moriranno. The young Rina was arrested, but the threat remained. Allora, lei non solo ha deciso di restare a Corleone, ma di, di dedicare dalla sua vita a lavorare antimafia perché... Perché fa questa scelta difficile, eh? coraggiosa? Faccio questa scelta perché voglio cambiare la mia terra, voglio cambiare la storia della mia terra e voglio dare un futuro migliore alle nostre future generazioni. Per prima i miei figli, ma spero, se Dio vorrà, anche i miei nipoti e i figli dei miei nipoti. The 1990s marked a turning point in Sicilian attitudes to the mafia a shift that could be traced to the very spot we were standing, from where the bomb that killed the magistrate Falcone on the motorway below us was detonated. Chiedere che cosa senti tu quando si sta qui? Qua tanto dolore, tanta sofferenza, però da qua anche tanta forza, tanta voglia, perché quel giorno quel detonatore che ha azionato la bomba ha azionato un'altra cosa in Sicilia, che è la coscienza dei siciliani. E lei ha ancora paura per la sua vita e per la sua famiglia? E come diceva Giovanni Falcone, solo gli stupidi possono non avere paura. È ovvio avere paura eh, tutti i giorni, eh, tutto quello che si fa. Ma vivere con la paura significa non vivere. La mafia è still present in Sicily, though less violent than before. But for many, this land will always be linked with the ultimate mafia movie, The Godfather. I retraced Al Pacino's footsteps to a famous scene in the Bar Vitelli, filmed not in Corleone, where the mafia demanded the piso, the protection money, but in the eastern hill town of Savoca. The bar, set up by their great aunt, is now being run by Giulio and Dario Motta. We've been here for a little while and yeah. we've seen hundreds of people come to see the, the yeah. place, place. Yes. where it was filmed, which you've kept kind of unchanged here. How do you feel that you are running a business yeah. on the basis of a film that made the Mafia so famous? Yes. You know, uh, does that sit badly, difficult, as a difficulty for you or how do you see it? No, no, it's not difficult because um, it's a movie. It's a, um, a real situation that isn't a, a good thing, the Mafia, but uh, it's uh, a part uh, of the history of the Sicily. What calls the tourists here is the Godfather, but what makes them stay here is the sun, is the limoncello, is the granita, is the coffee, is <laughs> the <barbitelli>. everything. <laughs> granita for breakfast. Yeah. No, it's the <laughs> best idea ever, like kind of the sort of thing. But I have to ask you, if you know, the Mafia is still part of, of Sicily's story today, yeah. in different forms yes. than it was before. So if tomorrow a Mafia representative came to you here at Barvitelli and said, it's time to pay the Pisa, what, what would you say? How would you deal with that? I think that uh, if someone comes here and uh, asks me pizza, I give to him the granita. And after, he, he can go home, no problem. And what do you think? I mean, would you agree? I think that um, we, we close the bar. We will close the bar. <laughs> Rather than pay yeah. the pizza. Yeah. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen yeah. and that Barvitelli continues yeah. to flourish. And I think we need to get a photo yeah. of us all together yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll by be the poster right. before we'll be we go. Like, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I came here and I said, oh, look at those people wanting yeah. to wear the hats and sit there and yeah. it's so stupid. Well, yeah, yeah. And now I like kind of the... <laughs> So all I want to do is just stand here with you guys. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> the mayor of Palermo, Leo Luca Orlando, has been a long-term opponent of the Mafia. So how does he feel Sicilians should face the future? 
to be mafioso was to remain closed inside our roots. Mm -hmm. Honor, family, friendship, Catholic faith, and we died. Because the mafia killed us. Finally, the people decide to open the eyes. And not long ago, forward as in the past, not seeing, not speaking, not eating. So you've argued that the Mafia covered up the true Sicilian character, but how would you describe that character today? The Sicilian character is uh, today is impossible to define <laughs> because it's a meeting point. So I am Sicilian in a completely different way than uh, the Sicilian that is in front of me because we are all a different combination of identities. Mm -hmm. So this different combination of identity lets us see appear to be the world in the future, when it will not be possible to close inside roots. Mm -hmm. The Sicily has understood this necessity to combine roots and wings. After 3,000 years of conquest and immigration, Sicilians today are proud of their mixed heritage. So what can they tell us about how to cope with one of the greatest challenges of modern times? I travelled to the Sicilian island of Lampedusa, just a short distance from the Libyan coast, on the front line of Europe's migrant crisis. We've come down to the port, and soon enough, a bus is going to arrive with a large number of migrants who have been saved from the seas by the Italian Coast Guard, and they're going to board the boat to head on to Sicily. Their journey already to this point has been miraculous in many ways. Just this year alone so far, 3,000 people have died trying to cross the Mediterranean seas. falls to the Coast Guard to try and save those lives. Coming here to Lampedusa and getting out on the sea gives you an entirely different perspective on what is the largest migration of people since the Second World War. There is a law of the sea. Politics doesn't matter. Nationality doesn't matter. Race, gender, ethnicity, none of it matters. If there is somebody in trouble, you respond. Mi parla un pochino di, di che cosa senti quando si vede i migranti sul mare, si eh, può aiutare, aiutare i migranti? L'emozione è grande, il primo giorno che ho preso servizio a Lampedusa ho, siamo stati a recuperare un barcone con 750 persone e non mi nascondo che mi sono sceso due lacrime. Poi dopo quello è diventata, per me è diventata una routine. Abbiamo perfezionato una macchina a bordo di, di lavoro che in 10, massimo 15 minuti riusciamo a tirar fuori dall'acqua 120 persone in un modo velocissimo. Noi li vediamo gli immigranti che arriviamo vicino da lui e con gli occhi impauriti. Una volta che è a bordo incomincia già a sorriderci, a, a ringraziarci. Comandante Monaco. At Coast Guard headquarters back on Lampedusa, I asked the man in local charge of the operation, Comandante Monaco, if he thought Sicilians saw the migration problem differently from other Europeans. In reality, the acceptance is something that is difficult, but it is natural, because when you see these people in particular, immigrants who come in a zona del mondo eh, particolarmente difficile, dove ci sono guerre, persecuzioni, eh, dove non c'è un futuro per la propria famiglia. Sì, la Sicilia è stata sempre oggetto di varie invasioni, o comunque passaggi di diverse civiltà, quindi è chiaro che un siciliano ha magari nel proprio DNA proprio questo, eh, questo passaggio, questa accoglienza e anche eh, il migliorarsi proprio dalle altre culture che, che sono passate nel tempo alla Sicilia. Io da siciliano devo dire che eh, stare qui mi orgoglisce particolarmente. In Sicily we have had in the last two years 400,000 migrants who arrived in Sicily. You have not heard, you have not read one single act of intolerance. 
one single act of intolerance. We are giving an example to the rest of Europe. Welcome is the best guarantee for safety. When some strange migrant arrives, the migrants call the mayor, and the mayor speaks with the police. Because they feel Palermo, their city, they defend their city. In London, the refugees feel London, their city. In Paris, the refugees, they call police or they close the eyes. It's fair to say, I think, that the mayors of London or Paris or Brussels might well say to you, how many of those people will want to live in Sicily? How many of those people will want to live in UK? Uh, it's not going to be a problem for you, it's going to be a problem for us. What would you say in return? You can say to people, you cannot live here uh, because we have not enough hospitals, not enough apartments, not enough uh, schools. But today we are in the hands of politicians who have not understood that in the stomach of human beings there is no intolerance. Mm. The intolerance is in the, in the, in the, in the kill mind of some politicians. If they send a message of fear, the people have fear. If they message of safety, the people feel safe. And today, Palermo is exciting and safe. Sicilians have lived in a world of constant change, never quite sure what the future may hold. Back on the slopes of Mount Etna, I met a young winemaker, Chiara Vigo. Against all the odds, she and her husband Gianluca are bringing new life to her family's vineyard, despite the fact that Europe's largest active volcano is on their doorstep. I think Etna people live in a sort of fatalism. We live on a <laughs> volcano, but it's normal. Otherwise, you be, become crazy, I think. And can you explain to me, what is that? That, that very thick line of, of ground right there? Have you, have you excavated this? No, no? <laughs> this is lava. This is the eruption 1981 that arrived until here. The lava destroyed uh, two main roads and also 20 hectares. And here, just in front of this vineyard, decided to change direction. Hang on, hang on. So that is volcanic lava? Yes. Can we go and, and yes, see Yes, of course, okay. <laughs> of course. It's, yeah, it's just so, it's so menacing when you get up close. I mean, it's what, two and a half, times my height, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in another place on the lava... Please, lead the way. Lead the uh, way. There is a very strange surprise because we, we discovered some uh, vines survived under the lava. Wow. So this is a vine that was covered by the lava in 1981. Yes. And then the roots have forced their way through, through the, lava the lava to find the light, to find light, the sun. sun and... Wow. I mean, this is not a, an easy... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a hard rock, eh? Yes. This is not an easy rock to find your way through. My God. That's why I feel the responsibility to take care, because um, in my life uh, there were important moments, uh, like the lava, and after some years uh, uh, my, my father uh, died here. Um, so there are some moments very, very intense uh, that are linked with this place, and I cannot leave this place. It's in my blood. I can completely understand. Is this the only vine no, that survived? No, no, not at all. There are some there are other. More. Yes, there are more. With uh, grapes. With grapes. Great. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> what will you call this? Will you give these this wine a particular name or the survivor? <laughs> the survivor wine. I love it. This vine was covered by the eruption of Etna back in 1981. That was the year of my birth. And ever since then, it's been pushing its way back up to emerge triumphant again. And you know, I, I feel quite silly, actually. <laughs> I feel uh, almost kind of moved to tears, not by an example of human tenacity, but by an example of nature's ability to survive and 
Wow. Wow. That's one impressive plant. Sicily has, over the centuries, moved from being an absolute backwater to being the epicentre of world events and back again. And as a result, many people you talk to will talk about the sadness of the Sicilians, the sadness that comes from being repeatedly conquered and from having events totally out of your own control. But in this journey, I haven't found that. Instead, I've been overwhelmed by the pride, the joy and the excitement that Sicilians feel about their island and about their future. And as Sicily once again becomes the epicenter for the great issues of the 21st century, of globalization, mass migration, you feel that this time, Sicily and the Sicilians might well be ready to show us the way. And I wish them luck.